Hello again. We changed the batteries yesterday before the salutation service, but we thought that we don't want to take any chances, so we put another fresh pair of batteries now. Uh, before we begin, I would like to ask for the consensus. We're running early. This is a Greek Orthodox Church, and we're running early. May God forgive us for this. <laughs> If I have the general consensus, we can start early since everyone is here and everyone is in place. Do I have a consensus? The consensus is there anyone that disagrees with that. Once again, may God forgive us for doing this, but we will do it. Okay. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to you, God. Glory to you. Βασιλεύ φοράνια παράκλητα το πνεύμα της αληθείας, ο πανταχού παρών και τα πάντα πληρώνω, θησαυρός των αγαθών και ζωής χορηγός. Ελθέ και σκήνωσον ημίν και καθάρισον ημάς από πάσης κυλίδος και σώσον αγαθέ τας ψυχάς ημών. Our Father, Lord, be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Father, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever to the age of ages. Amen. The grace that shone forth like a torch from your mouth illumined the universe. It laid up for the world the treasures of freedom from avarice. It showed us the height of humility. But while instructing us by your words, Father John Chrysostom, intercede with the word Christ our God that our souls be saved. We receive divine grace from heaven and through your lips you teach us all to worship the one God in Trinity. O oh, blessed venerable John Christum, rightly we praise you, for you are our teacher who makes clear the things divine. May St. John Chrysostom illumine and guide the steps of all the participants. And thank you all. You may be seated. Now, before we begin, I would ask all the participants, as you come in here, make the microphone your possession. Lower, raise it up as needed. The same thing with the podium. This is why we have this podium here, because it's flexible. And before you start your presentation, make sure that we can hear your voice. It will be unfortunate to give the wonderful presentation, and I'm sure all presentations are wonderful and have the microphone that far. So make it your personal possession, okay? Do not be afraid if you can hear your voice. That's the goal. Thank you. Um, to the speakers, uh, the timekeeper is Mark Smith, our deacon. He's sitting in the third row and the judges are in the front row. Um, we will start with uh, the juniors, as we said earlier, and um, speaker number one um, will talk about topic three um, on the day of Theophany, January the 6th, we chant, all those who were baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Discuss the meaning of this hymn and the obligations it places upon us as Orthodox Christians. 
uh, is speaker number one present and did, do I have the right topic? Please come on up. Greetings, Reverend Fathers, Honorable Judges, my fellow speakers, friends, and family. The lives that we live are always being influenced by the things and people around us. I think that's a very bold claim. Why? Well, what if someone just stays at home all day? Then you could say that they watch TV or are on the internet. But what if that person doesn't have anything like that? Well, they probably have an animal of some sort. What if they have nothing? And this is something that I want you to think about. Not one person in this world has nothing because every single person in this world is made for something. It's how God created us, why he created us. Now, on January 6th, the day of Theophany, we chant, all those who are baptized in Christ have put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. Well, what in the world does that have to do with a person who doesn't have anything or is created to do something? Let me tell you. But first, let me explain this hymn. To be baptized is very important in the Orthodox religion. And this hymn tells us that to be baptized is to put on Christ and become one with him. This tells us many different things, but we'll get into that later. When you get baptized, it means that no one person is different from another. You don't look to see if someone is of a different religion or different skin color because it truly doesn't mean anything. We have all been joined together under Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.28. We are all together, and this is similar to almost like a veil or one skin that we all share. None of our human bodies matter. Instead, we are all spiritually connected to one another. When we are joined to Christ and joined together, we have certain responsibilities. If Christ isn't on the earth in a bodily form, then we are to live as though we have his obligations, such as helping those around us like they are our family. With that territory comes the fact that we are not Christ, but we are merely the beings whom he guides, and we are to follow the guidance that he gives us. We are also to be accepting and forgiving to all those around us no matter what they have done to us. And we should always do our best every day to the extent that we can. All in all, our lives are our choice, but the decisions we make reflect upon us and the people important to us, like Christ. We are created for something. And if you are ever having trouble in your life, then take a moment to think about what Christ would want you to do, what being baptized gives you the choices that would help you, or maybe give you answers to your questions. My advice, let Christ lead you, and you will be just fine. Thank you. Yeah, uh, after each, each speech, we're going to wait a couple of minutes to give the... Uh, to give the judge time to make notes.
me. Judge, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, Let's talk a little bit, see if the judge can hear you. <clears throat> can, come on up. Yeah, not your speech, but let's um, start your speech, maybe, that you've got from memory to see if the judge can hear you. Can you, can you start your speech, sort of, yeah. see if the judge can hear you. Greetings, Reverend Fathers, Honorable Judges. Is it better? Do you think it's fair to me? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Greetings, Reverend Fathers, Honorable Judges, my fellow speakers, friends, and family. The lives that we live are always being influenced by the things and people around us. I think that's a very bold claim. Why? Well, what if someone just stays at home all day? Then you could say that they watch TV or are on the internet. But what if that person doesn't have anything like that? Well, they probably have an animal of some sort. What if they have nothing? And this is something that I want you to think about. Not one person in this world has nothing because every single person in this world is made for something. It's how God created us, why he created us. Now, on January 6th, the day of Theophany, we chant, all those who are baptized in Christ have put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. Well, what in the world does that have to do with a person who doesn't have anything or is created to do something? Let me tell you, but first, let me explain this hymn. To be baptized is very important in the Orthodox religion. And this hymn tells us that to be baptized is to put on Christ and become one with him. This tells us many different things, but we'll get into that later. When you get baptized, it means that no one person is different from another. You don't look to see if someone is of a different religion or a different skin color because it truly doesn't mean anything. We have all been joined together under Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.28. We are all together, and this is similar to almost like a veil or one skin that we all share. None of our human bodies matter. Instead, we are all spiritually connected to one another. When we are joined to Christ and joined together, we have certain responsibilities. If Christ isn't on earth in a bodily form, then we are to live as though we have his obligations, such as helping those around us like they are our family. With that territory comes the fact that we are not Jesus Christ but we are merely the beings whom he guides, and we are to follow the guidance that he gives us. We are also to be accepting and forgiving to all those around us, no matter what they have done to us. And we should always do our best every day to the extent that we can. All in all, our lives are our choice, but the decisions we make reflect upon us and the people important to us, like Christ. We are created for something. And if you are ever having trouble in your life, 
then take a moment to think about what Christ would want you to do, what being baptized gives you, the choices that would help you, or maybe give you answers to your questions. My advice, let Christ lead you, and you will be just fine. Thank you. Uh, speaker number uh, two, uh, also a junior, uh, will talk on topic number three. On the day of Theophany, uh, we chant, all those who are baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Discuss the meaning of this hymn and the obligations it places upon us, Orthodox Christians. Speaker number two, please come on up, and I assume you have the right topic. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Reverend fathers, honorable judges, brothers, and sisters in Christ, good morning. Today, I'd like to talk to you all about the meaning of the hymn, All Those Who Have Been Baptized Into Christ Have Put On Christ, and What Commitment It Places Upon Us. To begin with, we chant this hymn on January 6th, the Feast of Holy Theophany. This is the day in which we celebrate Jesus Christ being baptized by St. John the Baptist in the Jordan River. When we partake in his baptism, our sins are buried and we become born again in Christ. During this holy sacrament, the Holy Spirit descends upon the holy water and extinguishes our transgressions. Because of this, we are called to start a new life of love and focus on how to retain the grace of God. Holy baptism is the way that we access eternal life, and thankfully, it is available to all who want to receive it. Now, putting on Christ means the gift of the Holy Spirit cleanses our souls from sin and enables us to walk in Jesus' light. We can achieve this through baptism, prayer, partaking in the other sacraments of the church, and most importantly, by participating in the divine liturgy. When the Holy Spirit cleanses our souls from sin, we are able to concentrate on worshiping God, helping others in need, and living a good and fulfilling life in Christ. When we walk in Jesus' light, God blesses us with his grace and the ability to do good deeds in his holy name. We will endure hardships and we will come across people who don't believe, but with God's grace, we can overcome these obstacles and make the world a better place for everyone. In God's eyes, we're all equal. In his epistle to the Galatians, Apostle Paul states, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This verse clearly tells us that God knows that all of us, no matter who we are, have the ability to do good, 
and to follow his divine commandments. If we put on Christ, we will be given the strength to do what God commands. But the choice is ours. When God created us in his image and likeness, as recorded in Genesis chapter 1, he gave us free will. And with this free will, we can choose whether to accept Christ into our lives and trust in him, or live our lives separate from him and face the challenges of the world without his help. Furthermore, when we put on Christ, we are called to become Christ-like. It becomes our responsibility to spread the word of God. We are also called to always be compassionate, patient, forgiving, and to always treat people with respect and dignity. An example that most of us can relate to of being patient is when we're frustrated with our parents. We should still listen to them and respect them, even if we disagree with them. To prove this, Apostle Paul teaches in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 1 through 2, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. An example of treating everyone with respect and dignity is when we are with a group of people that we know. If someone else wants to join our group, we should always treat them with respect and try to include them. The Lord gives us a great example of this in the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. In this account, Jesus was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, and a blind man named Bartimaeus was calling out to him by the side of the road. He was getting ignored and even shushed by the disciples, but Jesus went to see him. Jesus asked him what he wanted, and Bartimaeus told him that he desired to have his sight. Wanting to reward his faith, Jesus then blessed Bartimaeus with his sight. So to conclude, the meaning of the hymn, All Those Who Have Been Baptized Into Christ Have Put On Christ, is to live a God-pleasing life while walking in Jesus' light, and to try our hardest to live like Jesus did. Thank you. Speaker number three, a junior, will uh, talk or speak about topic number two. Many of us have heroes to whom we look up to. It may be an older brother or sister, an athlete or a musician. We have heroes in our religious life as well as people who inspire us to practice our faith. They teach us, usually by example, how we are to live as Orthodox Christians. Select a saint or person who has been the most influential in your spiritual life. Describe the particular and practical ways that influence has taken place. Please come on. Greetings, Reverend Fathers, Honorable Judges, Fellow Parishioners, good morning. How does a person grow in the Orthodox faith? I believe it's by participating in the life of the church. My niece Nora is only a few months old, and I notice that she is learning by watching everything around her. She watches everything we do. She even started to mimic a few things. 
that's similar to how I learn about my faith. I watch what people do during liturgy. I watch my parents, my priests, and everyone in my community. We all learn by example. There are two people in, that are role models to me, my godparents. Godparents are people that are already in the Orthodox faith that agree to help guide you on your journey to become an Orthodox Christian. You receive godparents when you are baptized. When I was younger, I went to a Pentecostal church with my grandmother. It's very different from an Orthodox church. When I first came from an Orthodox church, I was a little overwhelmed. There were icons everywhere, and at the time, I didn't even know what an icon was. I was a stranger, but then I met Brittany and Matthew. Brittany and Matthew welcomed my family and invited us to dinner. They answered a lot of questions we had about Orthodoxy. I was pleased that my priest chose Brittany and Matthew to be my godparents. When my parents and I were baptized, Brittany told me what was going to happen. She was there every step of the way. After the baptism, she put a beautiful cross around my neck, and I asked her what it was for, and she told me it was protection and told me not to take it off. My godparents are super patient with all my questions, and I'm very thankful for that. Brittany has taught me so many things since I became Orthodox. I will be talking about three that come in mind. The first one I'll be talking about is how she taught me to be a myrrh bearer. Myrrh bearers, including my patron Saint Susanna, are the brave women that followed Jesus and after his crucifixion went to his tomb to prepare his body with spices, linens, and of course myrrh. At my church, we have a myrrh bearer ministry. Girls ages 6 to 14 can carry a candle in the great procession representing the myrrh bearers. Brittany taught me how important it is to remember the myrrh bearing women and their amazing task. Another thing Brittany taught me is the tra tradition of making purse for him. Purse front is the blessed bread our priest uses in the Holy Eucharist, representing the myrrh bearers. Brit oh Holy Eucharist. Brittany had a cooking class and invited me to join. I was thinking it was like baking cookies or even making a cake, but I def it definitely was not. Purse front is not an easy thing to make. There are important prayers you say and how to get the dough just right. My friend Rain and I mix all the ingredients together. We stamped the bread with a purse for our seal before Brittany put it in the oven. After it sat, we wrapped it in plastic wrap, and we put it in the freezer so it would be ready for liturgy. The final thing I'll be speaking to you all today is how Brittany is teaching me to be a godmother myself. I recently became a godmother to two little boys named Rocco and Kai. I enjoy being their godmother, and it's been amazing to have Brittany by my side to ask for advice. For example, Brittany told me what I had to get for the boys' baptism, and I went to her church to, um, to decorate their can baptism candles. I want to show Rocco and Kai the importance of following Christ and to make myself as inspirational to them as Brittany is to me in my Orthodox Christian life. My godparents are my heroes in my Orthodox Christian life, and I hope one day I could be Rocco and Kai's hero as well. I feel it's important to have godparents because they assist you in your spiritual development, especially as a child. Thank you. Speaker number four, uh, a junior, 
uh, will speak uh, about topic number four. When reading the parable of the prodigal son, we learn about the various stages of repentance. What are they? How do they relate to the reversal of the son's journey away from the father? What does the father's reaction upon seeing his son teach us about our relationship to our father in heaven? Uh, speaker number four, please come on up. <clears throat> Reverend fathers, honorable judges, ladies and gentlemen, fellow orators, Galimera. I'm starting to reach that age where I realize that I do not necessarily know everything. I think everyone experiences this at some point in their adolescence. School gets a little more difficult, sports become a little trickier, and everything seems to take a little more effort, time, and patience. This oratorical experience, from writing the speech to sharpening my delivery to standing here in front of you today, each of these has broadened and deepened my knowledge and understanding of the topic, often in unexpected ways. This year, I learned the meaning of the word prodigal, and to be perfectly honest, I was surprised at my own misunderstanding of this word. The story of the prodigal son is so universally known in our culture. The prodigal son leaves, he squanders his inheritance, and in doing so forsakes and dishonors his family, his father, his home. The prodigal son returns a sinner spiritually lost, seeking repentance and forgiveness. Consider my shock when I looked up the word and learned that prodigal actually means wasteful. The prodigal son isn't prodigal because he abandons his father and his home. He is prodigal because he spends his father's money and mismanages what he has given, leaving himself destitute. Jesus relates the parable to his disciples to illuminate the necessity of repentance. We will err. We will stumble. We are and will always be called to repent, to give a name to the mistakes we make, to make concerted efforts to change for the better, and to ask for forgiveness from those we have wronged. Reading the parable, one wonders if the father even registers the wasteful behavior. So fully overwhelmed that his son is home, the father's love overcomes any chance of resentment. The father falls upon his son like water, wrapping him in his arms, both acknowledging and understanding his son's mistakes, not waiting to hear his son's confessions or pleas to be forgiven. The father gives unconditional love and forgiveness just as Christ did in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross of Calvary. The Son repents and the Father forgives. Repentance takes courage and humility. Forgiveness takes effort, time, and patience. As Christians, we have the dual responsibilities of repentance and forgiveness. We must forgive those who wrong us, even if not immediately. And we must repent for our own wrongdoings promptly. For Jesus tells us in Matthew 4, 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yes, we at times often resemble the prodigal son, wasteful of the gifts given to us by God. But we must remember our father in heaven is always forgiving, shown to us through Jesus Christ, the model we are all to follow. Therefore, we should rejoice unconditionally in the return of those who may seem lost, hoping to see them return home to our loving arms. My fellow Orthodox Christians, may we find ourselves always welcomed home, no matter our faults, our failures, or our mistakes. Thank you.
speaker number five, uh, a junior, uh, will talk about or speak about topic number four. Uh, speaker number five, could you please come up? Do I need to repeat the topic of the prodigal son? Please let me get that in. In reading the parable of the prodigal son, we learn about the various stages of repentance. What are they? How do they relate to the reversal of the son's journey away from the father? What does the father's reaction upon seeing his son teach us about our relationship to our father? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> Reverend clergy, distinguished judges, brothers and sisters in Christ, the second Sunday in the Chirodion in the Orthodox Church is when we read the parable of the prodigal son. We read this parable on that Sunday because it, hel because it is helpful to us in preparing for great Lent, since the theme of the parable is repentance. Lent is a time to get ready for Pascha, when we celebrate Christ's glorious resurrection. During Lent, we focus on our faith, our relationship with God, and on repentance. But what does this parable teach us about repentance? It teaches us that there are various stages to, repent, to repentance, and among them are realization, regret, and change. To begin with, realization is the first stage of repentance. In the parable, the prodigal son takes his early inheritance from his father. He spends it extravagantly, loses it all, and ends up having to work by feeding pigs. He had been leading a sinful life, being selfish and greedy. But one day, while he is feeding the pigs, he realizes that he has done wrong. It says in the gospel, quote, And when he came to himself, Luke 15, 17, which seems to imply that he did not realize how much he had been sinning. But once he realized it, he felt ashamed. This leads to the next stage of repentance, which is regret. The prodigal son went from having so much to having nothing. He understood his ignorance and, then, and, the, con and the consequences his bad decisions caused. He was possibly angry with himself. It was a moment of humility. The prodigal son clearly felt regret over his sinfulness. However, feeling guilt is not the same as repentance. It is not just enough to realize and regret. In order to fully repent, we need the final stage, which is to change. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, repentance means, quote, to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the, amendments of, to the amendment of one's life, end quote. This is what the prodigal son does. He says to himself, quote, I will arise and go to my father and say to him, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Luke 15, 18 through 19. This shows change because he is turning away from his sin, and he shows humility as he returns to his father. He confesses his sin, shows a change of heart, and then acts. In conclusion, the parable of the prodigal son is a parable that Jesus told in order to teach the disciples and us about repentance. In the parable, we see three stages of repentance, realization, regret, and change. We also see the loving and compassionate father forgiving his son. So likewise, when we sin, if we repent, God will forgive us. As St. John Chrysostom says about this parable in Exhortion to, Theod Exhortion to Theodore After His Fall, letter one, quote, let us not continue in evil, nor despair of reconciliation, but let us also let us say to our all, let us say also to ourselves, I will go to my father, and let us draw nigh to God. Thank you.
Speaker number six, a junior, will give a speech about topic number one. His All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew has earned the title of Green Patriarch and was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World for his teachings about humanity's spiritual responsibility for taking care of God's creation, planet Earth. His All Holiness stands on the shoulders of saints who taught us that the world is a gift from God and that taking care um, of his creation is a way to connect with God. Explore and discuss the teachings of his All Holiness and the saints on the creation of the world. What are some of our practical responsibilities as stewards of our planet and how does that enrich our lives as Christians? Speaker number six, please come on up. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Reverend fathers, honorable judges, ladies and gentlemen, fellow speakers, good morning. We are called, indeed we are obliged, to, pres to embrace our role to preserve the earth as a gift and resource offered to humanity by a loving creator. These wise and humbling words are from his All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, commonly referred to as the Green Patriarch. Patriarch Bartholomew has devoted his life to the understanding and care for our earth. Today, I'm going to talk to you as the, er, er, as the earth from a gift from God, how we are treating his masterpiece, and what we as Orthodox Christians are called to do to preserve this masterpiece that we call home. God created the entire universe. And in that universe, he created just one planet that could sustain life. With his mighty yet gentle hands, he skillfully sculpted the earth and filled it with life. This seemingly simple green and blue sphere is filled with beautiful colors and millions of creations uniquely designed by God. Consider the complexity of Earth's dynamic systems. Contemplate the diversity of life on Earth. Imagine the most beautiful places that you've ever seen. God's paintbrush is vast. God's masterpiece reminds us daily just how awesome he truly is and how much he loves us. You may be thinking to yourself, what am I doing? It can't be that bad. How are we using God's gift? Are we exploiting it and treating God's complex creation recklessly like it's simply replaceable? We treat God's sacred grounds with arrogance as if we have the right to do whatever we want. We treat the earth carelessly, continuing to strip its natural resources until there is nothing left. It may shock you to hear that we can see what we have done to the earth all the way from space. The scale of human impact is just astonishing. We do not have to wait for the future to see the consequences of our actions. Once beautiful places that we have degraded and destroyed are already filled with human suffering, despair, and death. How would you feel if you graciously offered your home to someone and they wrecked it? They ate all the food, trashed every room, left garbage, and then just left. So imagine how God must feel, watching his creation simply be exploited, destroyed, and abandoned. When giving something so amazing, shouldn't we practice good stewardship? I think we need a talk from Earth's Parish Council. If you noticed your home was falling into disrepair, you wouldn't sit around and wait for it to crumble around you. You would hopefully take action. I have some good news. It's not too late. Earth is our home, and now is the time for us to repair God's holy creation. As Genesis 2 verse 15 says, humans are commanded to care for God's creation. We as Orthodox Christians are not just asked, but charged by our most loving, most awesome God to care for his creation. We are going to restore his wonderful creation in all of its beauty. Our overwhelming impact to date is in fact evidence that we humans are smart and strong enough to change the world when we work together. So I urge you, no matter how small the step it is, take it, what you do matters. Each simple step we take to care for this gift is how we will grow spiritually closer to God. By caring for his masterpiece, we are being faithful servants on his land. We each have our effects on the earth. I hope that you challenge to 
I hope that you challenge yourself to realign your relationship to the earth in a way that makes our father proud, especially when it comes to the gift that we call home. Thank you. Speaker number seven um, is the last of the junior speakers. Um, she will give a speech about topic number five. The Orthodox Church has a rich heritage of sacred hymns that contribute radiant and poetic splendor to Orthodox worship, thus opening the way to God. Select your favorite church hymn and talk about how it strengthens your faith. Speaker number seven, please come on up. Can everyone hear me? Reverend fathers, honorable judges, family, and friends, good morning. Today is the crowning of our salvation. This is the hymn we sing each year on March 25th, My Name Day. I remember being four years old and singing this hymn just after finishing our evening prayers. Hearing this hymn brings me back to so many moments of my childhood, but one always stands out. That memory was the day I learned the hymn. After weeks of listening to my mom sing it and trying to get the words and pitch perfectly, I finally did it. The joy and happiness I felt in that moment was just an ounce of what I felt when I learned the true meaning of this beautiful hymn. At three years old, Banaya went to the temple for the first time ever and went immediately into the Holy of Holies. There she was brought angelic and heavenly foods. Archangel Gabriel was the one bringing her food, and because of this, she was called full of grace. She had all the graces from the Holy Spirit. She would read and study the holy books of the temple. She would even counsel and comfort women at her time there. When she left the temple, she was a little over 15 years old. She was betrothed to Joseph, an elderly man to protect her. One day in the house where she was staying, Archangel Gabriel came to Mary to tell her she would bear a son, his name would be Jesus, and he would be the long awaited savior for the people of Israel. We read in St. Luke chapter one, verses 26 to 38, when Archangel Gabriel said, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. After all that, the archangel said, Banaya responded, How can this be, since I do not know a man? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, 
and the power of the highest will overshadow you. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Panayah said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. At this most sacred moment that we call the Annunciation, which is when the Holy Spirit came upon Panayya and when the original sin was removed, the Holy Spirit purified her. This hymn is sung on the Annunciation feast day, which is nine months before Jesus was born on December 25th. This feast was established in the late 6th and early 7th centuries. Aside from this, Panayya was only at the age of a middle schooler when she received this news. I am in middle school right now, and I could never imagine at this age being told by an angel that I would bear the Son of God. What an amazing example Panayya has set for us. She was a young woman when she received this beautiful and most powerful message. I admire her faith, obedience, strength, and undeniable commitment to God. It's not just me that can relate to Panayya, it's all of us. It's important that everyone recognizes how great of an example Panayya can be to the faithful and the great protection to the people that trust her and dedicate their lives to Christ. I am fortunate enough to be named after my grandma. Together, every March 25th, we attend liturgy and receive Holy Communion. It makes me feel so close to my grandmother and to this wonderful feast day. In conclusion, this hymn can remind us of the amazing way that the Virgin Mary received the message that she will bear our Savior. It also reminds me personally of those times when I was first learning the hymn and of growing up forming my life in and for Christ. Most Holy Teotoko, save us. Thank you. We now start the senior division, um, senior speaker number one um, will give a speech about topic number one. His All Holiness, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, has earned the title of the Green Patriarch and was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World for his teachings about humanity Ah, I thank you. I got lost there for just a minute. Thank you very much. Sorry. Topic number one for the senior division. Um, slandered without cause, convicted without a trial, exiled unjustly, this was the life endured by one of the greatest saints of our times, Saint Nectarius of Aegina. Forgiving others who hurt us that deeply and unjustly seems almost impossible. What can we learn from St. Nectarius, whose life was about forgiving about some, what some might call the impossible? Uh, speaker number one, please come on out. Hello. 
Reverend Father, Honorable Judges, fellow parishioners, my fellow speakers, good morning. Thank you for supporting us this Saturday. One of the most repeated words in the Bible is to forgive, to practice gratitude. Picture being thankful for someone who has not only physically attacked you, but has also subjected you to public humiliation, leading to the loss of your job, your friends, and your entire life. Imagine offering forgiveness to someone who forced you to move repeatedly due to malicious rumors, making it nearly impossible for anyone to accept or employ you. Can you fathom forgiving, and not only that, but being grateful to someone who inflicted such hardships on you? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the life of St. Nectarios of Aegina, a saint who not only forgave, but was grateful for all the hardships that God brought to him. During his lifetime, St. Nectarios faced multiple convictions. Early on, he faced accusations of theft, dating back to his childhood, when he was accused of being involved in taking money from his employer, a tobacco merchant. However, the truth behind this accusation revealed a story of generosity. The funds in question were actually a gift from a neighboring shop owner who was deeply moved by the saint's heartfelt letter to Christ. Saint Nectarios was also known for his ability to provide healing miracles, helping those who were suffering not only physically, but spiritually. His popularity as a bishop garnered admiration from the public, but also stirred jealousy among his colleagues. Rumors circulated, fueled by a sense of rivalry, convincing his superiors that he wanted to replace the patriarch. The repercussions of these controversies significantly disrupted St. Nectarios' life, prompting a series of relocations from Alexandria to Athens, Eboia back to Athens, and eventually Aegina, since no church wanted him to preach. Despite the tumultuous circumstances he faced, St. Nectarius remained steadfast in his devotion to God. This enduring trials that tested not only his character, but also his resilience of his spiritual calling. Now, knowing what the saint went through in his unwavering dedication to God, what can we learn from him? As we've entered Great Lent, I've reflected on the life of St. Nectarius connecting it to my own. The last preparatory Sunday before the Lenten period each year is the Sunday of forgiveness. The gospel reading tied to the Sunday is from Matthew 6, 14 through 15, which reads, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. As Greek Orthodox Christians, we have a duty to forgive and continue to have faith. St. Nectarios serves as a then-living example of resilience and faith to all. His life teaches us that forgiveness is not only a virtue, but a force that can elevate our souls and bring us closer to God. To be forgiven by God, we must forgive others first. In our daily lives, we encounter challenges, conflicts, and disappointments that may test our faith and our ability to forgive. St. Nectarios endured persecution and suffered with grace, demonstrating that forgiveness is not a sign of weakness, but a manifestation of strength and spiritual wisdom. Moreover, St. Nectarius' life emphasizes the importance of maintaining faith amid trials. In a world filled with uncertainties, maintaining a strong connection to our religion becomes a source of solace and guidance. Just as the saint remains steadfast in his devotion to God, we too can find strength and purpose in our faith, enabling us to, give, to navigate life's challenges with resilience and hope. As Greek Orthodox Christians, we are called to embody the teachings of Christ, who exemplified forgiveness and persistent faith. Micah 7.18 states, He does not keep his anger as a witness, for he delights in mercy. Through forgiveness, we can strive to create a community that reflects the love and compassion taught by our theology, ultimately contributing to a more harmonious and spiritually enriched society. St. Nectarius' life serves as a profound example of forgiveness, faith, and dedication to living this Orthodox life. His unwavering belief shaped every aspect of his being, inspiring us to emulate his devotion. Throughout his story, I've recognized that Christ worked through St. Nectarios, and his story pushes me to reflect how Christ works through me and through all of us in our daily lives. Reflecting on St. Nectarios' teachings and Jesus' lessons, I've learned that the small decisions we make every day, guided by forgiveness, faith, and a commitment to righteousness, pave the way to everlasting life in the kingdom of heaven. May we continue to draw inspiration from St. Nectarius' legacy and strive to embody his virtues in our journey towards spiritual fulfillment and divine grace. Thank you.
Speaker number two in the senior division will give a speech about topic number three. Christ says, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. He also says, unless you eat the flesh of the son of the man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Explore the Orthodox teaching of the Eucharist by reading the prayers and the divine liturgy and the writings of one or more of the church fathers. Speaker number two, please come on up. Can you hear me? Greetings, Reverend Fathers, Deacons, Honorable Judges, Brothers and Sisters in Christ, good morning. The one question that I and the rest of humanity have asked is, what is the meaning of life? The answer to this giant and intimidating question, however, is quite simple. The meaning of our lives is to commune with the one true and living God on an intimate and personal level. This kinonia is what humanity was made for. Being made in God's image, we are to become by grace what God is by nature, as St. Athanasius of Alexandria once said. According to the prayers of the Divine Liturgy and the teachings of the Holy Fathers, the Holy Eucharist is one of the fullest manners in which we may commune with God. For our Lord Jesus Christ says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. The Holy Eucharist is a great mystery, and I would even go so far as to say it is the mystery of all mysteries. For we are involved in this mystery, and by it we are united to all the faithful and to God himself. Just about a year ago, I was given the great honor and privilege to serve in God's Holy of Holies. And this is a tremendous responsibility, and with it I've been able to hear the prayers that the priest says, during the Divine Liturgy and during the Proscomiti service before the Divine Liturgy. With every prayer, there is great spiritual knowledge which reveals how immeasurable this mystery is. One of the prayers during the Proscomiti service, which is the service that happens right before the Divine Liturgy in which the Holy Gifts are prepared, the priest states, for you, Christ our God, are the offerer and the offered, the accepted and the distributed. We again hear similar words in the prayer of the Chair Vic Hymn. When the priest says, you as the master of all became our high priest and delivered unto us a, the sacred and service of this liturgical and bloodless sacrifice. These prayers reveal that Jesus is the priest and the sacrifice all at the same time, which is a great mystery, which therefore requires contemplation. God sacrificed himself out of his extreme love for us all. For Christ our God humbled himself by becoming incarnate and suffered and gave himself over to death, so that we all may be freed from slavery to sin and death, which was prefigured when the Israelites sacrificed a pure lamb during the first Passover, and by its blood they were saved from slavery from, to the Egyptians. The Israelites would perform a sacrifice each and every year in remembrance of their sins. However, their sacrifices were insufficient, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins, as St. Paul says in his epistle to the Hebrews. However, Jesus, our high priest, has completely dealt with sin by his sacrifice of himself. At every divine liturgy, we, call, we are called to come with fear of God, faith, and love to draw near and to receive the true body and blood of Christ. How can this be? How can we come and receive Christ's true body and blood if his sacrifice upon the cross was over 2,000 years ago? Well, Christ, when he instituted the Holy Eucharist, tells us this. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he also tells us, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Jesus, our Lord, tells us that the Holy Eucharist is a remembrance of his sacrifice. And it is also his very body and blood. Because of this, Christ's bride, the church, has throughout all of history understood that when we come to the divine liturgy, we are mystically transported out of space and time and taken to the throne of God, where with all the faithful throughout all time, 
witness and partake in the one and only sacrifice that took place upon the cross 2,000 years ago. As St. John Chrysostom states, it is not another sacrifice as the high priest, but we offer always the same, or rather we perform a remembrance of a sacrifice. Through this divine supper, which God has given to us by his grace, we are given a way to be reconciled to God. St. Nicholas Cabasilas writes in his commentary on the divine liturgy, that the celebration of the Holy Eucharist is an essential act, and its aim is the sanctification of all the faithful, who through these mysteries receive the remission of sins and the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven. This sanctification is not our own doing, rather it is permitted by God's grace when we approach him in a prepared and genuine manner through prayer and fasting. So dear brothers and sisters, let us draw near to this great mystery and joyce meal with our great Lord and God, that we may be united to God and to each other. Thank you and glory to God. Speaker number three in the senior division um, will speak about topic number two. Apostle Paul refers to Adam as the first man and Christ as the second Adam. The fathers of the church, especially Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, refer to Christ and Panagia as the second Adam and the second Eve. Why is the most holy Theotokos called the second Eve? And why is Christ called the second Adam? How do Christ and Panagia fulfill and go beyond their prototypes? Speaker number three, please come on up. Can everyone hear me? Reverend fathers, honorable judges, Brothers and sisters in Christ, good morning. Rejoice, Banaia, you are the redemption of Eve's tears. This is the first stanza of the salutation service to the Panaia. My faith does not require proof. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. I believe in the Lord, Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. However, we have been gifted with the Holy Scriptures which do provide proof through the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies in the Holy Gospels. Mark chapter 9, verse 24 says, I believe, help my unbelief. The Lord always helps us in moments when we lack faith, our moments of unbelief. Just as he helped the father whose son was possessed by an unclean spirit and answers our plea. The works of Saints Irenaeus and Ephraim the Syrian draw parallels between Jesus and Banaia with Adam and Eve, displaying a reversal of the consequences of the fall. They highlight the obedience of Jesus and his human nature in Banaia, contrasted with the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve disobeyed God's command to not eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, leading to the fall of humanity. Banaia was instead obedient to God's will, 
leading to our redemption. Eve disobeyed God's commandment, ate of the forbidden fruit, and convinced Adam to follow. In contrast, Banahia remained fully obedient, saying, Behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Found in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. While the devil in the form of the serpent manipulated Eve to separate man from his union with God, Panaia became a vessel of obedience to God who abolished the power of the evil one and brought about man's salvation as her offspring crushed his head. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Adam disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, but Jesus, as the new Adam, willingly offered his obedience to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. While Adam would not abstain from the fruit in the garden, Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. While Adam clothed himself in animal skins out of shame, Roman soldiers stripped Jesus and divided his garments in an attempt to shame the unshameable. The thorns God brought from the toil of Adam's hands as a consequence of his transgression became the crown of our eternal king. While the tree of life stood at the center of the Garden of Eden, with water flowing down to its borders guarded by the cherubim, which prevented the return of Adam to his original perfect union with God, Jesus was nailed to the new tree of life, the cross, on the top of Golgotha, with divine blood and life-giving water flowing from his wounds to wash the sins of all humanity. And the border, which kept us from God's presence in the Holy of Holies, where Banaia lived for 12 years, the veil of the temple, was torn into. Jesus in his humanity is not just a descendant of Adam, but in his divinity, he created Adam. He is not just the son of David, but also the one David called my Lord in Psalm chapter 110, verse one. He is the rock described by Daniel in chapter two, verse 34. The stone discarded by the builder, which became a cornerstone and a stumbling block to many. First epistle of Peter, Chapter 2, verse 7 through 8. He is the Christ. Banaia surpasses Eve, the mother of humanity, because the Banaia is the mother of our salvation. She is not just the Christophorus, Christ bear. She is the Theotokos, God bear. She is Jacob's ladder. She is the Ark of the New Covenant. She is Aaron's rod that budded. She is the womb within which God the Logos became flesh. She is the mother of God incarnate and the mother of us all. Thank you for your considerate attention. Senior speaker number four um, will speak about topic number four. The number of natural disasters worldwide continues to increase, resulting in more communities destroyed and more lives lost. How would you respond to someone who questions why God allows natural disasters to happen when we know God can intervene at any moment? 
If God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving, how can he allow evil things to happen? Uh, speaker number four, could you please come up? Reverend fathers, honorable judges, and fellow parishioners, good morning. Why do terrible things happen to good people? The Bible teaches us that God is an omnipotent and benevolent creator. If he truly is all-knowing, all-powerful, good, and loving, why does he allow suffering and natural disasters? The devastating impact of Hurricane Katrina, famine and diseases in Africa, and wildfires in our homeland of Greece are only a few that come to mind. If we are good and faithful Christians, why does he not protect us and prevent these dreadful things from happening? To understand the concept of theodicy, we must turn to the teachings of our Orthodox faith and consider God's benevolent creation, the fall of Adam and Eve, and his plan for our salvation through Jesus Christ. First, let us consider the story of creation and the unique role of humankind. In Genesis 1:26, God says, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. Humans were created in goodness to be caretakers of God's world. We are both earthly and spiritual beings and the infinite goodness of God is shown in his creation. We are, in Genesis 1:31, it tells us, God saw everything he had made and indeed it was very good. Nothing he made was evil. He gives us the gift of free will, but as a result, we can fall to sin. In the fall of Adam and Eve, their sin resulted in punishment and separation from God. A punishment not out of anger, but in the hope of repentance. Due to the disobedience of Adam and Eve, sin was passed on to the rest of humanity. That sin brought judgment, disease, and death to our world. The Lord warns us to prepare for disasters until the end of time. In Mark 13, 8, saying, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. The evil in this world was not God's intent. The book of Revelation tells us that God plans to rid the world of evil with recreation in the new Jerusalem. Jesus Christ came as the perfect sacrifice to take the punishment for our sins as the Lamb of God. But his crucifixion did not end suffering, it was for our redemption. When we join Christ in his suffering, we are saved from the toils of this world and are allowed to experience the perfection of the afterlife. Mark 13, 13 tells us, you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. The book of Job teaches about a righteous man who endures disaster after disaster at the hands of Satan. Job lost everything, his wealth, his possessions, and even his children were taken from him by evil and natural disasters. His friends and even his wife urged him to question his faith for all of the agony that he had endured but he remained pious. Job exclaimed, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As I reflect on my own life, I remember the devastating fire that destroyed our St. George Church here in Knoxville on the morning of Easter in 2015. I remember waking up that morning eager to celebrate and I walked downstairs to find my mother crying as she watched the news footage of flames devouring our church. My family and our church community were crushed and in disbelief. How could this have happened? I was standing here in this church only a few hours earlier for the resurrection service. Despite the absolute devastation and tragedy that our community was facing, so many blessings came from this. The most miraculous of all was the resurrection candle on the altar. It had survived the blistering heat of the fire and was alive during the, like amid the ashes of the church. As humans, we are not fully able to understand God's plan, but I learned that in the midst of tragedy, God is always with us. So how do we as Orthodox Christians respond to suffering? How do we respond to the tragedy in our lives? 
We must be humble, repentant, and rejoice in God's mercy. As humans descended from Adam and Eve, we must understand that we will face tribulation. Let us remember John 16, 33. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. God is leading his creation to its final perfection. Jesus Christ, crucified and risen from the dead, is the only answer to our suffering. Let us rejoice in Christ's resurrection in the promise that one day there will be no more pain or suffering and all of creation will be restored. Thank you. Senior speaker number five uh, will speak uh, regarding topic number four. The number of natural disasters worldwide continues to increase, resulting in more communities destroyed and more lives lost. How would you respond to someone who questions why God allows natural disasters to happen when we know God can intervene at any moment? If God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all loving, how can he allow evil things to happen? Speaker number five, please come on up. Can everyone hear me? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Reverend Father, honorable judges, and fellow speakers in Christ, we live in a difficult world a sometimes seemingly terrible world. Each and every day, we hear about the latest tragedies, murders, crimes, wars and conflicts, not to mention natural disasters, including just recently the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. People, including little children, are dying of starvation. People continue to hate each other and cannot seem to get along. It is a world where it feels as if there is no hope for us. In times like these, in a world like this, our very own faith can become the most difficult struggle. We may find ourselves, and within reason, asking, where is God? How can God, who is a good God and has such authority, rule over a world so cruel? This is perhaps the most difficult part of the faith and the most common argument among non-believers. Yet as believers, the way we answer this question greatly affects our outlook on the world and our relationship with God, a relationship that must stay strong if we are to live in a world so broken. As the prophet Isaiah wrote, if your faith does not endure, you will not endure. So how can God's world be broken? Well, maybe it's not as broken as it seems at least in God's eyes. When we define God as all-knowing, all-loving, and all-powerful, this means we must allow for his divine providence over the entire plan of the universe. God's providence is eternal and infinite outside of time, and it defines all of time forever, while we who live in time are unable to see the big picture. While it may seem that terrible things are happening and that God has let go of his hold on the universe, it is quite the opposite. 
The seemingly horrible things we experience in our lives and in our world are all part of God's plan, cliche as that may sound. God has his plan for a reason, whether to strengthen us or to guide us in a better direction. As St. John Chrysostom says, but if you are so curious and inquisitive, wait for the final outcome and see how things turn out. And do not be thrown into confusion and do not be troubled at the start. While we may not know it in the present, God's outcome is for the better and his providence will never fail us. Still, one could legitimately ask, if God allows all these obstacles in our way, how is this supposed to strengthen our faith? It can be so easy for us to give this a reason to doubt him and to distance ourselves from him. Allow me to refer to Chrysostom one more time, who wrote that in order to truly follow Christ, one has need of many toils and dangers. Speaking from the perspective of Christ, he says, For although it be in my power as Son of God to hinder you from having any trial at all, yet such is not my will for your sake, that you may yourself contribute something and be more approved. God's intent when allowing hardships in our path is the exact opposite of what we may think, for us to come closer to him because of it. St. Antony of Optina says, No matter what bitterness has befallen you, no matter what unpleasantness has happened to you, say, I shall endure this for Jesus Christ, and it will be easier for you. For the name of Jesus Christ is powerful. Christ's name is so powerful that through every natural disaster, through every grievance, big or small, he will carry us through, and we will emerge on the other side stronger, only if we have faith in him. All in all, God's everlasting love for us is never shaken, nor should we let hardships shake our love for him. In a broken world, broken by our sin and unfaithfulness, God is the one who will save us through his love. God is our hope. My final urge to all of you is whatever hardship you may be going through right now, whether as big as a natural disaster or sickness, or as small as a grade in school, it is all part of God's plan to bring you closer to him. After all, when our life ends or our world is broken a million times over, God is the one who will be there right until the end. Thank you. Senior speaker number six um, will speak uh, regarding topic number one, slandered without a cause, convicted without a trial, exiled unjustly. This was the life endured by one of the greatest saints of our times, Saint Nectarius of Aegina. Forgiving others who hurt us that deeply and unjustly seems almost impossible. What can we learn from Saint Nectarius whose life was about forgiving what some might call the impossible. Speaker number six, please come along. Good 
Reverend Fathers, Honorable Judges, Ladies and Gentlemen, Fellow Orators, good morning. In today's world, forgiveness is something we all struggle with. How do you recover after someone has done you wrong? It may seem so hard to wrap your brain around the fact of why someone would do something that hurts so much. Sometimes you will never understand the actions of others. However, through forgiveness, you can let go of the resentment. Because at the end of the day, we were not put on this earth to judge others, but to live a life according to God. One of the greatest saints of our time, St. Nectarius of Aegina, endured so much pain and slander throughout his life. Yet he always handled it with forgiveness. St. Nectarius, also known as Anastasios Kefalas, was born on October 1st, 1846. His parents were Demosthenes and Maria, and he had five other siblings in his family. St. Nectarios grew up very poor and was not given many opportunities to further his love for education and the knowledge of God. At just the age of 14, he was sent off to find work in Constantinople to continue his education, help with his family's finances, and to fulfill his passion in learning about Christ. Six years later, he was able to serve under Patriarch Sofrenos of Alexandria, Egypt. He was then sent by the Patriarch to study theology at the University of Athens, Greece. After completing his studies, he served as a priest and was later ordained bishop and assigned in Cairo, Egypt. With so much success to his name, people became very jealous of St. Nectarios and could not stand his popularity among others and his promotions in the ministry. Because of this, the clergy and bishops with whom he worked began to slander his name. Through this, they convicted the patriarch to believe these untrue accusations that they had made up about St. Nectarios. As a result of this, he was suspended by the patriarch from the metropolis. Not once did St. Nectarios try to defend his name himself. Instead, he put all his trust in Christ, knowing everything would work out. He found himself in Athens, poor, alone, ignored, and still being judged on his moral character. The only choice he thought he had left was to travel to Mount Athos, where he would at least have food and shelter. But St. Nectarios could not go through with this because even though that may have been a good decision to help himself through his struggles, he wanted to be present to help others who needed it more. After some time, he was eventually demoted to serve as a preacher, which was a big step down from his former position he had served. However, he never complained and served proudly. Among these, he also served as a dean of the Rosario Seminary in Athens. Even after everything that had happened, St. Nectarios prayed for those who persecuted him and never questioned God's will. Although he continued his prayer and fasting constantly, he yearned for the peace and quiet that came with the monastery lifestyle. St. Nectarios retired from his position as dean and with his spiritual daughters headed to Aegina, where he was able to establish a small monastery. Even after founding a monastery to help young women become nuns, his name would continue to be slandered. Despite this, St. Nectarios went on with his life, continuing to perform miracles and heal many people. After people had done him wrong time and time again, how could he still want to help others with the risk of false accusations? Humility, love for God and his creations, and most importantly, forgiveness. Someday, someone might do something to you, or maybe they already have done something that seems so unforgivable. You cannot even begin to think why that had happened. Learning from St. Nectarios and his life story, we begin to take steps towards forgiveness. Not everyone can be as easily forgiving as St. Nectarios because he had such a strong connection with God and truly put all of his trust in him. If we can learn day by day to put all our trust in God, we will easily be able to forgive others because no matter what, God has something greater in store. I would not even want to imagine my name being slandered as St. Nectarios's was. If we compare all our small conflicts in life to essentially the biggest obstacles St. Nectarios faced, our problems seem so insignificant. Forgiveness is always a step in the right direction to furthering your connection with God. Letting go of all the anger in your heart will free up space for greater things. Leave the judgment of others up to God and just live your life with his everlasting love. If you ever find yourself in a tough situation, whether someone is asking for forgiveness or not, think about St. Nectarios. Everything was taken away from him simply from accusations, and his name was continuously slandered all his life. Forgiving those who wronged him allowed him to stay humble, become a miracle worker and a saint whom we can all learn from one of the greatest lessons life has to offer. No matter how deep the cut may seem, forgiveness is the first step towards healing. Thank you.
Senior speaker number seven um, will um, speak about topic number four, the natural, I'm sorry, the, the number of natural disasters worldwide continues to increase, resulting in more communities destroyed and more lives lost. How would you respond to someone who questions why God allows natural disasters to happen when we know God can intervene at any moment? If God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving, how can he allow evil things to happen? Speaker number seven. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Reverend fathers, honorable judges, fellow orders, ladies, and gentlemen, good morning. The world that we are standing on is the gift of God's creation. Yet it is easy to look around and to see the evils that plague it. Between the wars, countless acts of violence, and natural disasters, we are able to see much of the sorrow and suffering that occurs. Yet regardless of the distress, we often ask ourselves the same question. Why does God allow his people to suffer at the hands of natural disasters? The answer to that question is in another question. What is the purpose of our life on this earth? If we look to the scriptures, we can see quite clearly that this world is not meant to be a perfect world. That reality echoes all the way back to the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve lost the privilege of living in eternal paradise. In Genesis 3.23, it states, the eternal God banished Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden and exiled humanity from paradise sentencing humans to live laborious lives. The world that we live in is not paradise, but rather a fallen order, a place where natural disasters are allowed to run rampant. In giving us free will, God lets us act as Adam and Eve did, but he also lets us suffer the consequences of our own actions. Around the world, we can see how much we have degraded our planet. We drive cars that pollute the air and destroy hundreds of miles of forests, leading to global warming, fueling hurricanes and other natural disasters. Yet God has not abandoned us by any means during the innocent loss of lives and the destruction. In Joshua 1.9, it states, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That is what God has given and guaranteed us. He has a plan in mind, and we must trust him. This world is not according to his ways. His will is much greater. In Revelation 21.4, it states, There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor suffering. There shall be no more pain. The kingdom of God that is awaiting us is much greater than any of us can imagine. And our suffering in this world is only temporary. And while this world is not meant to be a paradise, as Orthodox Christians, it can be hard for us to comprehend that. And oftentimes we want to blame our uncontrollable suffering on God. Yet we fail to understand that God is with us throughout all of our suffering and is there to help save us. Seeing God as the cause of our suffering is not the answer. Instead, we should look to the reaction of Job. A natural disaster destroyed his home and killed all 10 of his children. Job's reaction to this unspeakable loss was rather shocking. Instead of cursing God, in Job 121, he says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
The man who lost everything stays strong in his faith. He doesn't ask why, but instead trusts God's plan. This story can serve as a lesson to us. Maybe there is an opportunity presented in struggle and sorrow, a way that we can strengthen our faith. Instead of asking why, maybe we can start asking what. What can we do to help those who are afflicted by wildfires and lost their homes? What can we do to provide comfort to people who are going through their deepest and darkest times? What can we do to help those who lost everything to a tornado or suffered the unspeakable loss of life to an earthquake? Isaiah 43, 2 states, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall you be scorched. Therefore, no matter the suffering, God is with us. We shouldn't question him, but instead strengthen our belief in him because his will will overcome all evil. Thank you. Unless I miss someone, uh, these are all the speakers that we have. Could you have done such a wonderful job? Could you please give them a hand? <laughs> the participants and the family, uh, Father, come on up. Uh, may have some things to say in addition to what I've got to say, but um, and I'm gonna let you go first. I trust everyone enjoyed the speeches and presentations as much as I did. They were magnificent. Congratulations to you all. You did great. Now we will move and go next door for lunch and uh, while the judges will retire for deliberations, um, we will give the courtesy to judges to dismiss first, and then we will go next door, enjoy lunch, and uh, then we will come back to uh, hear the results, the awards, closing remarks, closing prayer, and uh, close the program right there. So. Thank you all for your participation. You really brightened the day today. A big round of applause for our participants one more time, please.